Woke up to a rather pleasant surprise this morning. Hyde Lede had posted one of my favorite movie scenes of all time. It's from Blade Runner, and it's, uh, I guess you'd call it Roy Batty's death speech. He's explaining to the man who killed him, or who wanted to kill him, and he's actually dying naturally, as it were, <laughs> and as much as a replicant dies naturally, um, why um, his existence mattered. His existence mattered to him. Um, you know, it's just one side of the equation. It's, it's kind of a biased point of view, but it's very eloquently uh, put to us. Um, I've seen things you people wouldn't believe. And then he goes through a long uh, explanation of all the cool things he's seen in his life. He's had quite an interesting life, only four years. Um, it's an interesting exploration. The entire movie Blade Runner is an interesting exploration of consciousness, memory, identity, reality, etc. What exactly it all means, or what it adds up to, or... What does it even mean to be me? Do indeed I even exist? Um, the original novel, Do Androids Dream of Mechanical Sheep or Electronic Sheep or something like this, Electric Sheep. Um, it just, what is consciousness? And what does it mean to be conscious? We're at that subject of the I again, aren't we? <laughs> um, Roy says... I have seen things you people wouldn't believe. In other words, that which I have perceived is not that which you have perceived. <laughs> um, the point of view essentially creates identity, at least identity in one um, in one sense. Not so much consciousness itself, but my own view of myself as, in this, in his case, Roy Batty. You haven't seen attack ships on fire off the shoulder of Orion or anything like this. I have. I. Uh, now, that's an identity. Um, but then he dies, of course. And where does his identity go? <laughs> he says, all those moments will be lost in time, like tears in the rain. You know, time to die. And then he just he vanishes, in a sense. Um, where does he go? He just ceases to exist, is the implication, I guess. Um, and then, of course, you know, I think we've all seen this movie. Um, the Blade Runner, Deckard, uh, who is in love with the artificial intelligence, <laughs> um, takes off and says, uh, Who am I? Where am I going? How long have I got? What does it matter? You know, we'll just... Uh, live and uh, again it, it it's fascinating it's a um, it's a life affirming movie very strongly life affirming where they basically confront all the things that are confronting us now virtual reality I suppose even though it's not really dealt with as much as say neuromancer deals with it um, but you know it deals with creating consciousness and in Blade Runner they have created it and it does have its own individual identity. The, the various consciousnesses that they've created, even though their memories are bogus, um, their bodies are built in such a way that they'll burn out quickly. Um, that sort of thing. Um, okay. But at the end of the day, something still knows that it exists. Now, that's the fascinating thing. I've always said that if we created AI, how would we know? <laughs> um, I don't think that we'd be sure. I don't think we'd ever be sure. And again, he, when Deckard is looking into Roy Batty's eyes as Roy dies, he's he's only hearing something external to himself. But, you know, the implication is, of course, Roy lived. He lived more than any human being did um, in his four-year lifespan. Uh, so, again, the implication is of Blade Runner, who cares? What does it matter if we are all living in a virtual reality? Who cares if um, intelligence is artificial? Who cares if our memories are all bogus and unreliable and even implanted by something else? What does it matter? The whole point is to actually be alive. And the Los Angeles of Blade Runner is a dismal dystopian place, polluted and 
raining all the time and you know just not a nice place to live and everyone seems to be cut off from everybody else this sort of urban jungle type environment so it's not exactly the nicest place to exist in um, but you know the replicants want to live now that they have been created they want life that famous scene I want more life fucker <laughs> um, again it, that's a biased point of view but by the same token it's a fascinating view into um, perhaps the future where we're genetically engineering consciousness and creating humans and this sort of thing um, and you know people say well ugh, you know is that really worth it well you know per the matrix we may have already done that a few zillion times and we just keep recycling ourselves through different virtual realities right so what difference does it make if we're just creating more and more consciousness when consciousness itself is the ultimate aim and if we do it we do it who cares how we do it uh, again I'm not saying I agree with this I'm just saying that's just the implications of these sorts of things um, but what uh, is interesting about Roy Batty's speech is his use of the term I that's the first uh, the first word of the entire sort of um, homily that he delivers you know and, and again it's um, you go back to say the Upanishads where these sorts of things I won't say that it was the first time they were ever um, explored but you know it's one of the major milestones in our understanding of what we are the Kano Upanishad who sends the mind to wander far who first drives life to start in it, on its journey who impels us to utter these words who is the spirit behind the eye and the ear now all these things imply that there is something behind all of this um, I would say though however that they're just asking rhetorical questions it, you know some people might say that they're misphrasing the question in the first place but whatever it is the ear of the ear the eye of the eye and the word of words the mind of mind and the life of life those who follow wisdom pass beyond and leaving this world become immortal there the eye goes not nor words nor mind we know not we cannot understand how can he be explained he is above the known and is above the unknown thus we have heard from the ancient sages who explained this truth to us religious poetic language rhetorical language um, kind of for some people that kind of spoils it <laughs> Um, to my sort of poetic frame, a turn of mind, I, I kind of like it to, to be phrased like that, but, you know, matter of taste. And it raises the question, what is the knower of the known? What is the, the eye of the eye? What is it that sees that which the eye, um, the eye allows to be seen? <laughs> At the end of everything, there has to be something perceiving it. Um... What is it that thinks that it is an eye, even if there isn't an eye? What is it that is convinced that it is? <laughs> what is Roy Batty referring to when he says, I have seen things? Or even if he's making a mistake and there is no I, fine. What is it that's making that error? <laughs> um, what is it that is making the fundamental um, error of assuming that it exists as an identity? something is on the receiving end of all of these things something is something is hearing that which is heard in other words all this stuff goes into my ear translates into electrical impulses that are fed into my brain and it creates a qualia to that which is which experiences qualia I guess that's what, what I would call the eye is that which has experiences um, what is Roy Batty talking about? You can say that he's making an error. Okay, he's misidentifying something. What is he misidentifying something for? Maybe Roy Batty, as Roy Batty brain, um, doesn't necessarily exist, or at least only his brain exists and creates this illusion called consciousness or identity or whatever. Okay, what is the subject of illusion? of the illusion what is it that's being fooled <laughs> what is it that's you know you you end up in infinite regression when you start doing this and 
that's why I think that the, this this subject is so fun because you know it's like determinism versus whatever. Uh, you know, it, all you really seem to be able to do is take sides or say no, no, you're just not explaining it correctly, and it's a fault of language. And this is where I guess you know things like fiction and music and poetry and things like that come in. Uh, that's the only way you can really talk about these things. Um, the Bible uses the term parables. You know, it's because you have to come at things parabolically. You have to come at things sort of elliptically. You can't actually come directly at these things because the only way to come at consciousness itself is through all that stuff that seems to be more or less an illusion or more or less transitory or more or less... Um, um, Unreal, okay, but what is it that is assuming that the transitory is real, <laughs> or what is it that's being fooled, or what is it that is confused? What is it that doesn't know? <laughs> um, fascinating speculations, and the Kano Upanishad that I quoted from, and Blade Runner, doesn't really posit solid answers. Um, they don't really posit, uh, um, you know proof that this is um, absolutely true. They just sort of say these are pretty serious questions that we really cannot answer yet. And the very fact that we can't answer them yet is um, I don't know one of the main and I suppose most useful pursuits of existence. What is this? What am I? even if I don't exist, what is it that thinks that it exists? And <laughs> back you go into the infinite number of recursions. Um, rather surprised that a hard determinist uh, posted that, but, um, well, there you are. 